Hi, everybody. Welcome to the, our third episode of Storyboard. I'm Heather, and with me here is Blake. Want to say Hello. hi, Blake? Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Good morning, Heather. So thanks for joining us again. Uh, last episode, we finished up uh, the second half of the Velveteen Rabbit. Um, I worked a little bit more on oh, finishing up the render of that. So let me just share that with you because uh, I don't quite get them done usually during the time that we've allotted here um, for episodes. So I go back and finish up the render. And here we go. Oh, nice. <laughs> so this was the finished render from the uh, second half of the Velveteen Rabbit when the fairies turning him into a real bunny. Uh, <laughs> You know, it was a great story. We had a lot of fun reading this with you. And we've got another one of the stories that I remember from childhood that we're starting today is Wind in the Willows. It's a fun story with rats and moles and <laughs> toads and, and all kinds of fun stuff. <laughs> I don't remember this story from childhood. And uh, I love the title. So I'm like, in. The second the title hits me, I'm in. And um, so it's been fun reading it and getting to know the story. Yeah, we get to read these stories a few times before we decide what we're going to share with everyone. So it's definitely fun, you know, remembering childhood. And I've actually discovered a couple of new stories that we're planning in the future that I've never read. So that's a lot of fun, too. Yeah. And sometimes these stories, in particular, these older stories, um they just wrote differently they use different language and um so sometimes they're kind of tricky to read so um i'll do my very best heather and everyone all right are you ready to start for us here and i'll start the drawing i am so right. the wind in the willows by kenneth graham the mole had been working very hard all the morning, spring cleaning his little house, first with brooms, then with dusters, then on ladders and steps and chairs with a brush and a pail of whitewash till he had all dust in his throat and eyes and splashes of whitewash all over his black fur and an aching back and weary arms. Spring was moving in the air above, in the earth below and around him, penetrating even his dark and lowly little house with its spirit of divine discontent and longing. It was small wonder then that he suddenly flung down his brush on the floor, said, bother and oh blow and also hang spring cleaning and bolted out of his house without even waiting to put on his coat something up above was calling him imperiously and he made for the steep little tunnel which answered in his case to the gravel carriage drive owned by animals whose residences are nearer to the sun and air. So he scraped and scratched and scrabbled and scrooged and then he scrooged again and scrabbled and scratched and scraped, working busily with his little paws and muttering to himself, up we go, up we go, till at last, pop, his snout came out into the sunlight and he found himself rolling in the warm grass of a great meadow. This is fine, he said to himself. This is better than whitewashing. The sunshine struck hot on his fur. Soft breezes caressed his heated brow. And after the seclusion of the cellarage he had lived in so long, the carol of happy birds fell on his dull hearing almost like a shout. Jumping up on all his four legs at once in the joy of living and the delight of spring without its cleaning, he pursued his way across the meadow 
till he reached the hedge on the further side. Hold on, said an elderly rabbit at the gap. Six pence for the privilege of passing by the private road. He was bowled over in an instant by the impatient and contemptuous mole who trotted along the side of the hedge, chafing the other rabbits as they peeped hurriedly from their holes to see what the row was all about. Onion sauce! Onion sauce, he remarked jeeringly, and was gone before they could think of a thoroughly satisfactorily, uh, satisfactory reply. Then they all started grumbling at each other. How stupid you are. Why didn't you tell him? Well, you didn't tell him. You might have reminded him and so on in their usual way. But of course, it was then much too late, as is always the case. It all seemed too good to be true. Hither and thither through the meadows, he rambled busily along the hedge groves, across the copses, finding everywhere birds building, flowers budding, leaves thrusting, everything happy and progressive and occupied. And instead of having an uneasy conscience pricking him and whispering, whitewash, he somehow could only feel how jolly it was to be the only idle dog among all these busy citizens. After all, the best part of a holiday is perhaps not so much to be resting yourselves as to see all the others busy working. He thought his happiness was complete when, as he meandered aimlessly along, suddenly he stood by the edge of a full fed river. Never in his life had he seen a river before. This sleek, sinuous, full-bodied animal chasing and chuckling, gripping things with a gurgle and leaving them with a laugh to fling itself on fresh playmate, playmates that shook themselves free and were caught and held again. All was a shake and a shiver, glints and gleams and sparkles, rustles and swirl, chatter and bubble. The mole was bewitched, entranced, fascinated. By the side of the river, he trotted as one trots when very small. By the side of a man who holds on one spellbound by exciting stories. And when tired at last, he sat on the bank while the river still chattered on to him, a babbling procession of the best stories in the world sent from the heart of the earth to be told at last to the insatiable sea. As he sat on the grass and looked across the river, a dark hole in the bank opposite, just above the water's edge, caught his eye, and dreamily he fell to considering what a nice snug dwelling place it would make for an animal with few wants and a fond of a Bijou Riverside residence, above flood level and remote from noise and dust. As he gazed somewhat bright and small seemed to twinkle down in the heart of it, vanished, then twinkled once more like a tiny star. But it could hardly be a star in such an unlikely situation, and it was too glittery and small for a glowworm. Then as he looked, it winked at him, and so declared itself to be an eye. A small face began gradually to grow up round it like a frame around a picture. A brown little face with whiskers. A grave round face with the same twinkle in its eye that had first attracted his notice. Small, neat ears and thick, silky hair. It was a water rat. Then the two animals stood and regarded each other cautiously. Hello, Mole, said the water rat. Hello, rat, said the mole. Would you like to come over, inquired the rat presently. 
Oh, it's all very well to talk, said the mole, rather pettishly, he being new to a river and riverside life and its ways. The rat said nothing but stooped and unfashioned a, unfastened a rope and hauled on it, then lightly stepped into a little boat, which the mole had not observed. It was painted blue outside and white within and was just the size for two animals. And the mole's heart went out all to it at once, even though he did not yet fully understand its uses. The rat sculled smartly across and made fast. Then he fell, held up his forepaw as the mole stepped gingerly down. Lean on that, he said. Now then, step lively, said the mole to his surprise and rapture, found himself actually seated in the stern of a real boat. This has been a wonderful day, said he, as the rat shoved off and took to the skulls again. Do you know I've never been in a boat before in all my life? What? cried the rat, open-mouthed. Never been in a, you never, well, I have, you, what have you been doing then? Is it so nice as all that, asked the mole shyly, though he was quite prepared to believe it as he leaned, leant back in his seat and surveyed the cushions, the oars, the rowlock, rowlocks, and all the fascinating fittings and felt the boat sway lightly under him. Nice. It's the only thing, said the water rat solemnly as he limped forward for his stroke. Believe me, my young friend, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, half so much worth doing as simply messing about in boats. Simply messing, he went on dreamily. Messing about boats. Ugh, messing. Look ahead, rat, cried the mole suddenly. It was too late. The boat struck the bank full tilt. The dreamer, the joyous oarman, lay on his back at the bottom of the boat, his heels in the air. About in boats are with boats, the rat went on <laughs> composedly, picking himself up with a pleasant laugh. In or out of them, it doesn't matter. Nothing seems really to matter. That's the charm of it. Whether you get away or whether you don't, whether you arrive at your destination or whether you reach somewhere else or whether you never get anywhere at all, you're always busy and you never do anything in particular. And when you've done it, there's always something else to do and you can do it if you like, but you'd much better not. Look here, if if you really nothing else on hand this morning, supposedly, we drop down the river together and have a long day of it. The mole wagged his toes from sheer happiness, spread his chest with a sigh of full contentment, leaned back blissfully into the soft cushions. What a day I am having, he said. Let us start at once. Hold a hard minute then, said the rat. He looped the painter through a ring in his landing stage, climbed up into his hole above, and after a short interval, reappeared, staggering under a fat wicker luncheon basket. Shove that under your feet, he observed to the mole as he passed it down to the boat. Then he untied the painter and looked at the skulls again. What's inside it? Asked the mole, wiggling with curiosity. There's cold chicken inside it, replied the rat briefly. Cold tongue, cold ham, oh, cold beef, pickle, herkin, oh my word, scrush and delicious meat, beer, lemonade, oh, soda water. Oh, stop, stop, cried the mole in ecstasies. This is too much. Do you really think so? inquired the rat seriously. It's only what I always take on these little excursions. And the other animals are always telling me that 
I'm a mean beast and cut it very fine. The mole never heard a word he was saying. Absorbed in the new life he was entering upon, intoxicated with the sparkle, the ripple, the scents and the sounds and the sunlight, he trailed a paw in the water and dreamed long waking dreams. The water rat, like the good little fellow he was, scolded steadily on and forbore to disturb him. I like your clothes, awfully old chap, he remarked after some half an hour or so had passed. I'm going to get a black velvet smoking suit myself some day, as soon as I can afford it. I beg your pardon, said the mole, pulling himself together with an effort. You must think me very rude, but all of this is so new to me. So this is a river? The river, <laughs> corrected the rat. And you really live by the river? What a jolly life. By it and with it and on it and in it, said the rat. It's brother and sister to me and aunts and company and food and drink and naturally washing. It's my world and I don't want any other. What it hasn't got is not worth having and what it doesn't know is not worth knowing. Lord, the times we've had together, whether in winter or summer, spring or autumn, it always has its fun and its excitements. When the floods are on in February and my cellars and basements are brimming with drink that's not no good to me and the brown water runs by my best bedroom window or again when it all drops away and shows patches of mud that smells like plum cake and the rushes and weed clog the channels and I can potter about dry shod over most of the bed of it and find fresh food to eat and things careless people have dropped out of their boats. But isn't it a bit dull at times, the mole ventured to ask, just you and the river and no one else to pass a word with? No one else to, well, <laughs> I mustn't be too hard on you, said the rat with forbearance. You're new to it, and of course you don't know. The bank is so crowded nowadays that many people are moving away altogether. Oh, no, it isn't what it used to be at all. Uh, otters, kingfishers, dab chicks, more hens, all of them about all day long and always wanting me to do something as if a fella had no business of his own to attend to. What lies over there, asked the mole, waving a paw towards a background of woodland that darkly framed the water meadows on one side of the river. That? Oh, that's just the wild wood, said the rat shortly. We don't go there very much, we river bankers. Aren't there, aren't there very nice people in there, said the mole a little nervously. Well, replied the rat, let me see. The squirrels are all right, and the rabbits, some of them, but rabbits are a mixed lot, and then there's badgers, of course. He lives right in the heart of it, wouldn't live anywhere else either if you paid him to do it. Dear old badger, no one interferes with him. They better not, he had it added significantly. Why, who, who should interfere with him, asked the mole. Well, of course, there are others, explained the rat in a hesitating, hesitating sort of way. Weasels and stoats and foxes and so on. They're all right in a way. I'm very good friends with them past the time of day when we meet and all that, but they break out sometimes. There's no denying it. And then, well, you can't really trust them. And that's the fact. The, the mole knew well that it's quite against animal etiquette to dwell on possible trouble ahead or even to allude to it, so he dropped the subject. And 
beyond the wildwood again, he asked, where it's all blue and dim and no one sees, may, and, and, and one sees what may be hills or perhaps they mayn't, and sometimes like the smokes of town or it's only cloud drift. Beyond the wild wood comes the wide world, said the rat. And that's something that doesn't matter either to you or me. I've never been there and I'm never going, nor you either. If you've got any sense at all, don't ever refer to it again, please. Now then, here's our backwater at last where we're going to lunch. Leaving the mainstream, they now passed into what seemed at first sight like a little landlocked lake. Green turf sloped down to the to either edge. Brown snaky tree roots gleamed below the surface of the quiet water, while ahead of them the silvery shoulder and foamy a uh, foamy tumble of a weir, arm in arm, with a restless dripping mill a mill wheel that held on its turn a gray gabled mill house filled in the air with a soothing murmur of sound dull and smotherly yet with little clear voices speaking up cheerfully out at intervals it was so very beautiful that the mole could only hold up both forepaws and gasp. Oh, my. Oh, my. Oh, my. The rat brought the boat alongside the bank, made her fast, held the seal awkward uh, mole safely ashore, and swung out the luncheon basket. The mole begged as a favor to be allowed to unpack it by himself, and the rat was very pleased to indulge him and to sprawl out full length on the grass and rest while his excited friend shook out the tablecloth and spread it, took out all the mysterious packets one by one and arranged their contents in due order, still gasping, oh my, oh my, at each fresh revelation. When all was ready, the rat said, now pitch in, old fellow. And the mole was indeed very glad to obey, for he had started his spring cleaning at a very early hour that morning, as people will do, and had no and had not paused for a bite or sup, and he had been through a very great deal since that distant time, which now seems so many seemed many days ago. What are you looking at? said the rat presently, and the edge of their hunger was somewhat dull, dulled, and the mole's eyes were able to wander off the tablecloth a little. I'm looking, said the mole, at a streak of bubbles that I see traveling along the surface of the water. That is a thing that strikes me as funny. Bubbles, ho oh, ho, said the rat, and chirped cheerfully in an inviting sort of way. A broad, glistening muzzle showed itself above the edge of the bank, and the otter hauled himself out and shook the water from his coat. Greeting, beggars, he observed, making for the provender. Why didn't you invite me, ratty? That was, This was an impromptu affair, explained the rat. By the way, my friend, Mr. Mole, Proud, I'm sure, said the otter, and the two animals were friends forwith. Such a rumpus every, everywhere, continued the otter. All the world seems out on the river today. I come up this backwater to try and get a moment's peace and then stumble upon a fellow, upon you fellows. At least, I, I beg pardon, I don't exactly mean that. Y you, you know, pack... Um, Oops, I'm sorry. Pack. My page got. Pack the luncheon basket. He did not speak as if he was frightfully eager for the treat. Oh, please let me, said the mole. So, of course, the rat let him. 
packing the basket was not quite such pleasant work as unpacking the basket. It never is. But the mole was bent on enjoying everything. And although just then he had got the basket packed and strapped up tightly, he saw a a plate staring up at him from the grass. And when the job had been done again, the rat pointed out a fork, which anyone ought to have seen. And at last of all, behold, the mustard pot, which he had been sitting on without knowing it still somehow, the thing got finished at last without much loss of temper. The afternoon sun was getting low as the rat sculled gently homewards in a dreamy mood, murmuring poetry things over to himself and not paying much attention to the mole. But the mole was very full of lunch and self-satisfaction and pride and already quite at home in a boat, so he thought, and was getting a bit restless besides, and presently he said, Ratty, please, I, I want to row now. The rat shook his head with a smile. Not yet, my young friend, he said. Wait till you've had a few lessons. It's not as easy as it looks. The mole was quiet for a minute or two, but he began to feel more and more jealous of rats sculling so strongly and so easily along, and his pride began to whisper that he could do it every bit as well. He jumped up and seized the skull so suddenly that the rat who was gazing out over the water and saying more poetry things to himself was taken by surprise and fell backwards off his seat with his legs in the air for the second time while the triumphant mole took his place and grabbed the skulls with entire confidence. Stop it, silly, cried the rat from the bottom of the boat. You can't do it. You'll have us over. The mole flung his skulls back with a flourish and made a great dig at the water. He missed the surface altogether. His legs flew up above his head, and he found himself lying on the top of the prostrate rat. Gently alarmed, he made a grab at the seat of the boat, and next, and then in the next moment, sploosh, over went the boat, and he found himself struggling in the river. Oh my, how cold the water was, and oh, how very wet it felt. How it sang in his ears, and and he went down, down, down. How bright and welcome the sun looked as he rose to the surface, coughing and spluttering. How black was his despair when he felt himself sinking again. Then a firm paw gripped him back by the back of his neck. It was the rat, and he was evidently laughing. The mole could feel him laughing right down his arm and through his paw and so into his into the mole's neck. The rat got hold of a skull and shoved it under the mole's arm. Then he did the same uh, by the other side of him and swimming behind, prop, propelled the helpless animal to shore, hauled him out, and set him down on the bank, a squashy, pulpy lump of misery. When the rat had rubbed him uh, him down a bit and wrung some of the wet out of him, he said, "Now, now then, old fellow, trot up and down <clears throat> the towering the towing path as hard as you can till you're warm and dry again, while I." dive for the luncheon basket. So the dismissed, the dismissal mole, uh, dismal mole, wet without and ashamed within, trotted about till he was fairly dry while the rat plunged into the water again, recovered the boat, righted her and made her fast, fetched his floating property to the shore by degrees, and finally dived successfully for the luncheon basket and struggled to land with it. When all was ready for a start once more, the mole, limp and dejected, took his seat in the stern of the boat, and as they set off, 
He said in a low voice with emotion, Ratty, my generous friend, I'm very sorry indeed for my foolish and ungrateful conduct. My heart quite fails me when I think how I might have lost that beautiful luncheon basket. Indeed, I, I've been a complete mess and I know it. W will you overlook it this once and, and forgive me and let things go on as before? That's all right. Bless you, responded the rat cheerfully. What's a little wet to a water rat? I'm more in the water than out of it these days. Don't you think any more about it? And look here. I really think you had better come and stop with me for a little time. It's very plain and rough, you know. Not like Toad's house at all, but you haven't seen that yet. Still, I, I can make you comfortable. And I'll teach you to row and to swim. And you'll soon be as handy on the water as any of us. The mole was so touched by his kind manner of speaking that he could find no voice to answer him. And he had to brush away a tear or two with the back of his paw. But the rat kindly looked in another direction. And presently the mole's spirits revived again and he was even able to give some straight back talk to a couple of more hens and who were sniggling to each other about his bedraggled appearance. When they got home, the rat made a bright fire in the parlor and planted the mole in an armchair in front of it and fetched down a dressing gown and slippers for him and told him river stories till supper time. Very thrilling stories they were, too, to an earth-dwelling animal like mole. Stories about weirs and sudden floods and leaping pike and streamers that flung hard bottles and at least bottles were certainly flung and from streamers, so presumably by them. And about herons and how particular they were whom they spoke to and about adventures down drains and night fishers with otter and excursions for a field with badger. Supper was most a most cheerful meal, but very shortly after afterwards, a terribly sleepy mole had to be escorted upstairs by his considerate host to the best be bedroom, where he soon laid his head on his pillow in great peace and contentment, knowing that his new found friend, the river, was lapping the sill of his window. This day was only the first of many similar ones for the emancipated mole, each of them longer and full of interest as the ripening summer moved onward. He, limp, he learned to swim and to row and entered into the joy of running water and with his ear to the reed stems he caught at intervals something of what the wind went whispering so constantly among them and that's, that's yeah. chapter one <laughs> uh, chapter one that's a lot of words it is but it's a fun story like i can yeah. imagine you know how much you know you want to kind of be there with them and have lunch with them and splash around in the river. <laughs> I got caught up in the words and my page got <laughs> turned. And some of the sentences are, are um, kind of complicated. And um, even though I read them a few times, um, I didn't know they were, where they were going sometimes. So uh, the, kind uh, of like the mole didn't know where he was going. <laughs> exactly. So thank you. <laughs> so the mole, uh, yeah, I learned a lot of new things. And uh, that's kind of the beauty of the story. If you know what a mole is, I mean, I, I've only seen a mole a couple of times. And, um, and they come popping out of the front lawn. People don't like them in their lawn. 
No. <laughs> uh, but I love how you put glasses on the mole um, <laughs> because they don't really see well, do they? No, they don't do not have great vision. So, uh, and you know, I thought you might like enjoy a nice little bow tie. He seems like a proper gentleman. <laughs> that, that, uh, you know. Well, he wanted a smoking jacket. So. <laughs> right. So right <laughs> now he's only got a little bow tie. <laughs> so the whitewashing uh, reminded me of, of all those days, you know, when spring comes and I remember my mother, it's time we're going to clean out the closets and that. So that's what the mole was doing. And, it's not fun work. No, who doesn't want to run away and spend a day on a river when you have housework to do? <laughs> spend a day on a river and a picnic <laughs> and learn about a, an entirely new world. And um, so I guess this first chapter kind of points that there's way more out there than the river. And um, I was intrigued about how they talked about the part they couldn't see right there, there's something over there but it, it doesn't relate to us let's just enjoy our day on the river and you know maybe that'll come along later but you gotta give them all credit like this is a totally different world to him like he just knows his little subterranean world and he's out there traveling and enjoying different experiences and different cultures and learning new things and meeting new people. And, you know, he's going to meet a few more interesting characters. You know, Rad is a pretty friendly guy, but he's going to meet a few more challenging characters later on in the story, I think. <laughs> <laughs> have you have you been in the Moles uh, situation in a brand new place? And, and absolutely... Constantly. Yeah. I, I liked it. You know, I think it's important that we put ourselves sometimes in situations where we're a little bit uncomfortable and cause that helps you grow and learn new things. And your worldview can be a little bit just what you're used to. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's hard to understand that there's really cool, really interesting people out there who've had very different experiences in their life and getting to meet those people and put yourself into their, their world is really fun. <laughs> and the other side of what you just said is they're a lot like us too. Mm -hmm. There's so many things that are alike. You know, we all like a place to sleep and we like to eat and we like to rest and we like to laugh and we like to dream. We like food. <laughs> we love sharing a meal with each other. <laughs> That's universal, right? Sharing yeah, a meal with it someone. Is. It is. <laughs> I, I remember, um, I'm not going to tell the story, but just to mention that my father and I went on a long trip to Africa and we found ourselves in just completely different in a completely different world. Uh, but after some time you kind of go, Oh, okay. Uh, this is pretty cool. It was like the, the mole. I, I kind of like this world. I might, you know, learned a lot about myself. And I think that's what the mole's doing too. Right. He's, it's, he's come out of his burrow. And he's like, wow, there's a big world out here that I haven't been experiencing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it'll be fun seeing what happens with the rat and the mole in the coming weeks uh thank you guys for joining us for this first chapter There's, we're probably not actually going to get through the whole book it's a pretty big book actually it's a big book but we had a great time drawing it and reading it with you and uh you know we look forward to next time when we see what their next adventure is <laughs> <laughs> good to be with y'all Thanks for joining us. Bye.